All right, just getting things set up. All right, we are now live on YouTube. So that's good. Looks like everything's all set. Let me just uh, pull up the analytics for that. All right, we'll get started in just about probably 30 seconds or so. Hang tight. All right, welcome Henry, welcome Evan, welcome Mara. We'll see who else shows up. Uh, I am actually gonna try to pay attention to the YouTube chat as well as the uh, Zoom chat, but priority goes to the Zoom chat because those people signed up. So, all right, so I think we should go ahead and get started right on time. Welcome, first of all, thanks for coming out today. Welcome to, uh, welcome back, I should say, for those of you who uh, follow what I've been doing here. Uh, this is the Other Life Podcast. You can uh, go ahead and get that on your phone if you find it easier to listen later. Uh, you should be able to find the Other Life Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. I am currently in the middle of a series where I'm doing something kind of special and focused. I'm doing a series on what I'm calling internet intellectuals and their digital hustles because there are a lot of people out there who are experimenting quite wildly with various types of models for being financially sustainable, but nonetheless doing what is on some level in very diverse ways, some type of what I'm calling intellectual work. And by that, I just mean pretty much anything outside the box of kind of the old school kind of marketer type of crap that uh, people will generally sell on the internet, right? So most people are familiar with, you know, all kinds of uh, how-to eBooks and kind of, crappy self-help stuff and scams really like there, there, of course there have been people selling books and courses and that kind of stuff on the internet for quite some time. Uh, but it's usually kind of get rich quick schemes. But what you're seeing now is there are a lot of people who are actually quite smart, are quite educated, are quite, you know, interesting in certain ways and are doing something, whether you like it or not, uh, something that's essentially more intellectually oriented. Uh, it's more disinterested. And this is as an academic and as a scholar uh, who's kind of chosen to, uh, de depart from all currently existing institutions to uh, find my own path on the internet. Uh, I'm very interested in surveying this scene. So um, that's essentially what this this uh, season or series of podcasts is all about. It's basically trying to understand uh, with as much diversity as possible what types of models, uh, kind of creative intellectuals are using or pursuing uh, today online and with an emphasis on those which seem to be most successful. So today's episode is going to be quite different. Uh, first of all, today's episode was originally going to be uh, with someone named Paul Scalis. Uh, however, I have I regret to inform you that Paul Scalis will not be joining us today, uh, not the real one or one of the many fake ones. You see, uh, what happened was, well, I'll get to what happened in just a minute, but instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to do an analysis of Paul Scalise. He's a very fascinating, weird case and very dubious in many ways. And frankly, to be perfectly honest, I see this episode as pretty much calling out a scammer because his whole project is uh, kind of ludicrously uh, exploitative and, and bullshit, really. And uh, so I want to go, I want to I show you what that looks like and I want to call him out for it. But on the other hand, he is clearly a fairly smart guy. He has real ideas, uh, which we'll break down in a little bit. Uh, he, he puts out content on the internet that is essentially kind of philosophical or, or social scientific, if you will. So, and I'll give you a kind of quick and dirty summary of who this guy is and what his ideas are all about. Uh, but so, so that's why he kind of qualifies for this kind of, uh, new world of, of what I'm calling kind of indie thinkers on the internet. Uh, but the way he's doing it, I think, is uh, just ludicrous and quite, quite terrible. I, you know, I, I think I think it's quite uh, I think what he's doing is ethically uh, uh, repugnant. 
And so part of this is I want to analyze what he's doing and, and show you what he's doing. And, uh, but the second thing is there are, there's still a lot to learn from people like this, uh, whether you like him or not, whether you like people like this or not, uh, he, people like Paul Scouse are kind of pioneering the outer edges of what is possible today, uh, with creative, weird kind of hacking of, of, of human psychology. And so while I'm not going to promote or encourage the tactics that he uses, I do think it's a very worthwhile case study, just as one of many people who are, who are who are pursuing quite weird grifts. Uh, and I think we can probably learn a number of uh, lessons from people like like this and uh, use them possibly in our own ways. So uh, that is what we're gonna be doing today. So I, I regret to inform you, uh, this is gonna be a solo stream. I'm just gonna be analyzing the case of Paul Scalas. All right, and so I would say uh, this particular case study is gonna have uh, two purposes, I would say. Uh, it's not just to kind of call out Paul, Scal Paul Scalas and reveal kind of the scam at the heart of his uh, project, but also the the value of this is to see one of the things I'm really going to try to can show you is how low the bar is. Okay, like this Paul Scalas guy has built a decent little platform. He's not super famous or anything like that, not super influential, uh, but he's got a decent little platform about like 7,000 Twitter followers. And uh, he does write a lot. Uh, he does put out real observations. And he's also got a very loyal fan base. You know, it maybe isn't huge, but the guy, whether you like him or not, has a kind of intellectual platform where he's developing philosophical and social scientific ideas and relatively successfully from nothing. As far as I can tell, uh, he has no credentials I'm aware of. And his books, as we're going to see in just a minute, are are really shitty pretty much. And uh, um and, and his whole kind of system is uh, kind of uh, shamelessly uh, kind of exploitative and, and disingenuous. Um, so the reason this is worth uh, looking into is because it shows you that if he can build this intellectual platform and actually have like a loyal band of followers who really respect him intellectually, then – uh, then, then I, I'm really trying to convey that I think anyone, anyone can do this. Okay. Uh, for those of you, cause listen, most of the people listening to this, a lot of the people in my audience, especially the members of indiethinkers.org, uh, a lot of, a lot of the people I've been hanging out with are really smart, capable, uh, kind of intellectually sophisticated people who want to do philosophy or science or this or that. And they want to do it on their own, build up their own platform on the internet. And, and if Paul Scalas can do it and he's not even that smart and he's doing it in this like extremely dubious kind of shameless way, um, a, a simply a decent, honest, smart person who's like willing to basically put out ideas uh, consistently can, can at the very least, I think, do what someone like Paul Scalas is doing. So that's going to be really kind of the upshot that, that I'm going to try to kind of cash out of this analysis is to show you really how low the bar is right now when it comes to uh, kind of creating financially remunerative kind of projects or products or services or whatever you want to call them on the internet today. Uh, if, if this kind of con artist, Paul Scalas can do it, I assure you that um, if you're smart at all and, and, and genuinely kind of invested in building out ideas and building out uh, kind of intellectual content over time, then I assure you that you can do it also. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the, the lesson I take from this. Okay. So uh, I am looking at the chat. If you have any questions or comments, um, I would be happy to uh, take them and, and I'll do my best to. Um, all right. So let's first kind of go over who this Paul Scalas guy even is. I'll do, I'll do a little screen share looking at, um, looking at some stuff, shall we? Uh, duh, duh, duh. All right. So look at, for instance, uh, yeah, look at let's have a look at his Twitter profile. So uh, this is what it looks like if you look at him through a private tab. If you look at him through your own Twitter account, you're probably blocked by him. <laughs> so kind of the first most interesting thing about the Lindy man's uh, kind of scheme or grift is he has this extraordinary unique tactic where he blocks tons of people by default. And uh, one of the reasons that's interesting is because he doesn't just block people. He will then tell you that if you want to get unblocked, you have to buy one of his books. 
So that, first of all, when I heard this, I was like, that's insane. And I have to say, it's, you got, you got to kind of, uh, you got to give them some credit for the, for the gall, uh, the, the audacity. And I've actually talked with, I've DM'd with a few people who have actually gone through with this uh, extortion racket. And uh, sometimes they say that they don't even, he doesn't even unblock you. Uh, people, people have told me that they bought his book to get unblocked and it never even came through. So it seems like um, this guy is really pretty much uh, a scammer in, in many ways. I mean, if uh, I, I don't know what else you, you would call that. Um, I just kind of, <laughs> I kind of appreciate the, the audacity um, and, and the creativity anyway. And so, what, okay, let's talk a little bit about what is this guy even, what's his shtick, right? Um, so basically he is known for one idea <laughs> really. Uh, and uh, we'll get into that idea in just a minute, but he pretty much has positioned himself as an acolyte of uh, Nicholas Nassim Taleb. Uh, for those of you who don't know who he is, he's, he's, he's legit. He's very interesting. He's written many books, very uh, kind of independent mind. He's also known for being quite aggressive. Uh, some would even say nasty or arrogant on Twitter. Personally, I'm a fan of Taleb. I, I think he's, I think he's very smart and I, I love his kind of brash um, kind of independence of mind. And uh, so what Paul Scalis has done is he's pretty much positioned himself as a kind of student of Taleb. And he also kind of traffics in the same kind of arrogant machismo of, of Taleb. And uh, what's interesting about uh, Paul Scalis's platform or project is that he's really just has one idea and it's not an, it's not an original idea. It's literally taken straight out of Nassim Taleb. Uh, it's this idea of Lindy, the Lindy effect and the Lindy effect. It, it's super simple. It's, it's really intuitive. Uh, the Lindy effect uh, is popularized by, by Taleb. Taleb writes about it at, at length and uh, it pretty much just means to sum it up. It's like the longer something has been around, the longer it will continue to be around is pretty much the, I think the, the most convenient way to summarize it. And uh, all right, I will, uh, so, so I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen, but I'll show you some other things in just a minute. And uh, so <clears throat> that basic idea, it's essentially a kind of trad idea, right? It, it clearly points to a, a kind of uh, traditionalist uh, implication, right? Because it pretty much means don't waste your time with stuff that's recent and fleeting and ephemeral. Uh, if it's new, if it just came around, it probably isn't going to be around for much longer. But, you know, the classics of civilization, whatever's been around for a really long time is, is kind of intrinsically trustworthy uh, in some, in some technical evolutionary way. And so it's a good, it's a good heuristic. It's a good principle. Um, and, and pretty much this guy, Paul Scalas has, has built an entire intellectual persona and a loyal band of followers and, and people who respect him. And now he's, and, he, and he's written and self-published many books, pretty much all just spinning off this one idea, which he didn't even develop. <laughs> and uh, so that's kind of the first thing folks is like, I mean, I talk on every day with people who are, who have interesting creative ideas. They want to write books and they want to develop different theories and stuff like that. And uh, you know, if you have any ideas at all, you're already significantly kind of more advanced and more impressive than Paul Scalas, right? This guy just took one idea from someone else and, and developed it into tons of tweets and uh, books. Okay, so if you have actual ideas, then congratulations, you're many steps ahead. And if Paul Scalas can uh, kind of build a platform off of one idea he ripped off of, of Taleb, I think you can probably write blog posts and tweets and, and eventually publish books on other ideas. But frankly, it is kind of a good insight though. What he's doing is kind of smart. Uh, one thing that the pal that this case study is showing already is that to, to develop ideas successfully and in, and with influence, they don't need to be new ideas. They don't need to be original. So, so one of the lessons here is you don't need to have your own novel ideas. And in some ways, if you look at Paul Scalise, it maybe even helps to just develop some of the ideas of other people out there who already have their own following. And frankly, I mean, you see this in academic, in, in kind of traditional academic trajectories also. It's always been a tradition in kind of the history of scholarship that at the beginning of your career, you write books about other things, right? You don't really have the right to develop your own ideas yet. And I think you're kind of seeing that with someone like Paul Scalise, right? Um, there are a lot of people who maybe ha ha do have their own ideas and they're very kind of, uh, you know, uh, 
into their own kind of some sort of original or novel concept that they want to develop and they want to tweet about it and they want to write a book about it, whatever. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's awesome. Obviously, it's good to be creative. It's good to have original ideas. But if no one knows who you are and you don't have a platform or already, then it's really hard to develop a truly novel idea or a novel theory or concept and and get that out there. Because why does anyone care about you? Why, you don't really have any, there's no real proof that what you're saying is real or valuable, right? And so one way to solve that problem is to uh, start by contributing or developing additional lines of thought on some idea or figure who's already out there and is established. And so by participating in that already known and respected figure or concept, then you're essentially allowing the, the, the interest and kind of the the informal respectability of that idea to rub off on you and how people perceive you. It's, you see this in academia, right? You even see this with Deleuze, for instance. Gilles Deleuze, the, the famous French philosopher who I recently wrote a book about, he he says this in his in in some of his interviews. He says, my first few books were just studies of other philosophers. For instance, he wrote a long book on Spinoza, he wrote a long book on Nietzsche, and and, and so on, and, and and a long book on David Hume. I believe those were his first books. And these were before he had his own philosophical voice. He didn't quite have the right yet to his own philosophical voice. So he does these long studies on great figures and kind of submerges his own unique ideas into these larger figures and, and, and these already known and respected ideas. But when you do that a couple of times, when you prove your, your skills, when you prove what you're worth by developing ideas around something that already exists that people already respect, then you're able to, to put your own more original work forward. And I think that's actually a really legit principle that has obtained in kind of the history of normal, traditional academic trajectories. Uh, but I think it's also persisting into, into the internet world of, of the new kind of indie thinker model that I've been, I've been developing. And uh, yeah, so I think the Paul Scalise case is a really profound example of how well this works to kind of hitch your wagon, at least in the early days, to some figure or idea that's already well known and that there's already a lot of interest in. In Paul Scalise's case, that's Nassim Taleb, and in particular, the concept of Lindy. This guy made an entire identity and persona and intellectual platform off of one idea he stole from someone else. Okay. Uh, another principle I think we're already seeing in, in this Paul Scalise case study is that uh, – consistency and quantity are are so powerful and there's this kind of problem a lot of people have where you feel like you're repeating yourself right like you feel like oh i shouldn't tweet about this one idea multiple times every day because you just feel like uh you're annoying people or you're afraid that you're going to be repetitive or whatever but it's not true it's it's really not true and that the more and the more consistent you can go on like one particular idea or set of ideas and the more quantity you can put out on that really one kind of repetitive thing, uh, the better. And this is for many reasons. One, you never actually repeat yourself unless you're copying and pasting, which you should never, you know, never actually copy and paste your own shit and post it over and over again. That would be terrible. Um, but if you are saying the same thing over and over again, like you're saying, oh, the Lindy effect is really good. The Lindy effect is really important. Here's why, here's why. If, if you're If you're constantly developing one idea over and over again, you're not actually ever technically repeating yourself because it's always going to be slightly different each time, right? And you're going to learn more about it by repeating yourself in that way. So every time you actually develop your understanding a little bit better, and even without trying, you say new things that are slightly better than the last. And that's one part of it is you technically never really repeat yourself. Uh, even if you kind of set out to constantly say the same thing, you're going to say it different and better each time. But the other thing is on the internet, it, and this does not square well with our intuitions at all. Uh, because our intuitions, our evolved mental hardware comes about from a lot, from millions of years of a face-to-face -face human interaction in, in tribes and shit like that, right? Uh, so this doesn't really parse for our, our brains, but the fact is when you're putting content out on the internet, you're not interacting with individuals. You're interacting with statistical aggregates, right? Like when you write a tweet, only a small fraction of your followers are going to see it, right? So... What that means is you can repeat yourself somewhat over the course of several weeks. And the fact of the matter is uh, very few people in your following will have actually seen all the stuff you've put out. So they won't be, no individual in the world is going to experience you as particularly repetitive. Even if you feel like, oh my God, I'm being so repetitive. I'm putting the same stuff out over and over again. 
And so, I mean, again, Paul Scalise is an amazing example of this, right? Because all he talks about is Lindy, Lindy this, Lindy that. And uh, if you were to look at all of his tweets and read every single one of his tweets every day, maybe you would get bored or you would be like, okay, I get it. Why, <laughs> why are you going on about this? Uh, but the, the genius of this strategy is that the reality is very few people will read every single one of anyone's tweets. And so by being more repetitive than feels comfortable, you're actually just being, you're actually just being perceived. You're being experienced by your followers as a uh, quite a normal flow of just someone who is interested in a particular idea and is developing that idea over time. In this case, Lindy. All right. So this is what I like about the case. This is what I, I'm interested in about Paul Scalis and why I think he makes a good case study is like, because he's so extreme in certain ways that seem kind of idiotic or, or laughable or shame or even shameful. Uh, the fact that he's, he's doing quite well, you know, in the modest way of, of that, you know, the, that, in, that indie thinkers can, can hope for. Like the whole indie thinker model as I've been developing it, it's not about getting super famous. It's not about getting super rich, not at all. Um, I think all intellectuals in all periods of all times and all times and places uh, have always needed to be relatively content with uh, relative obscurity and, and relatively modest uh, wealth or riches. Um, but what I'm interested in is, is how it's now possible to at least be financially stable, financially sustainable, and to have a non-trivial audience where you can, for the rest of your life, develop serious ideas as 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 a vocation, and you and you can you know earn at least a you know a, a decent income doing this. So it's it, it's now tr very tried and true. This is this is very well demonstrated now. There's thousands. There's at least thousands of people doing essentially intellectual work uh, over time as the main thing they do, and they're and they're making a decent adult income. So I'm not claiming you're going to get super rich. I'm not claiming you're going to be like a super influential, uh, you know, superstar philosopher or someone like Slavoj Žižek or something like those are all outliers. Um, so when I say Paul Scalise is relatively successful, what I'm saying is, you know, having 7,000 Twitter followers uh, where you're doing pretty much intellectual concept development over long periods of time as your main vocation and you're publishing your own books and people are reading them and you have fans and people are really interested and, and following along and uh, trying to learn from you and developing from you and you're making some amount of money doing it like that many you know i would consider that if you compare that to the history of intellectuals over time uh that is a, a relatively very successful it's been very hard throughout history for human beings to be able to do intellectual work as the main thing they do in life and to even just scrape by financially or to even just have a, a minimal audience to have anyone at all who cares okay so I'm just that's just a bit of a, an aside on on what I'm saying here. Uh, my kind of mo my model of the indie thinker is it's not at all some kind of like big, powerful, famous, uh, wealthy thing that I'm I'm saying is is a very easy. It's just uh, this kind of minimal audience building, this minimal kind of financial sustainability, and and really at the end of the day, the most important thing is just the ability and the the systems in place to be able to do intellectual kind of idea development over time. All right, so, um, so Paul Scalas clearly, I'd clearly uh, kind of meets that meets those criteria, and I think it's just amazing to look at his system because it's so it's so laughably kind of lame and bad and crappy, and uh, so that's why I think it's really instructive because if he's if if he's pretty much achieved this level of audience and fan loyalty and uh, kind of productive capacity over time on such weak fundamentals, then I think if you're actually a smart person, if you actually have real ideas and you're not going to try to rip people off, then uh, you should be quite inspired by this because the bar is so low. All right. So um, what else? Um, so I already went over his uh, kind of unblocking scheme. This like kind of ex extraordinary extortion racket where he'll block everyone. And then to get unblocked, you have to buy one of his books. Uh, let's now talk about the actual books. So um I'm afraid to say that I was I was unable to obtain any of his books, and I'm refused to pay. I refuse to pay for anything by him at, at least at this moment until until someone can show me that maybe some book is worth buying. I refuse to to submit to the scam just because I want to do some research on him. Um, but I have been told uh, from many sources that his books are pretty much just copy pasta from his tweets. So pretty much he will just take the tweets and throw them in the book. And in fact, if you look at his books. And the reviews online, it's hilarious. Let me show you actually. All of his books 
have terrible reviews, um, like really terrible. And uh, you can't even find many of them. Uh, like on Amazon, for instance, one of them is pulled because of quality reviews. So for instance, look at this one, the four hour life survival guide, how modern employment is ancient slavery. I think this is actually one of his better reviewed books and it only has three out of five stars. Look at those reviews, 11 customer ratings. Okay. Um, it's under review because it currently, uh, there are significant quality issues with the source file. So yeah, this is kind of what I'm talking about. He pretty much just throws a bunch of tweets and copy pasta into his books, gets it to about 130 pages, as you see here, and then uh, slaps a cover on it and, and sells it on Amazon. He's got like something like four or five books. Okay. And uh, you see the cover here. And uh, right. So clearly he's taken the four number from, uh, from uh, Tim Ferriss, the four hour work week. Again, you see the pattern here. You know, there's, there's nothing new under the sun. There's not some sort of a uh, genius or original idea. He's pretty much just uh, taking ideas from other people. And uh, so that's just one example, but look also at, uh, if you look at like the Goodreads reviews, I mean, the, the reviews are terrible. Like people pretty much across the board. I mean, there are some positive things, I guess. Um, but a lot of these are uh, pretty brutal and uh, just saying, saying it's bad. Like if you, and if you look at the actual reviews, look, women in the Lindy effect, one star, uh, Lindy effect, friendship, <laughs> three stars, women in the Lindy effect. That's actually as high. That looks like it might be as high as rated book women in the Lindy effect. Uh, and yeah, so pretty much uh, that one's not bad either. That's that is three stars. Uh, yeah. Or no, I'm sorry, four stars out of five. Um, so in any event, if you look over, if you, and then like a lot of his books aren't even available, like this one paperback out of print. Uh, okay. You know, the crappy covers, right? So uh, what I'm really trying to show you all is that the ideas are extremely derivative, pretty lame. Uh, he puts like very little effort into making anything look good. And uh, nonetheless, he's got a healthy amount of followers and many of them are quite loyal. And uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know how much he's making. I think this book, for instance, I looks like it's his most successful because it has 19 ratings. And this is pretty high, actually. This has some pretty good ratings. So I was perhaps a, a little too harsh. He has many negative reviews, but it looks like some you know, some of his books have, have decent ratings, actually. So this is not bad. Uh, Life and the Lindy Effect came out in 2018. But like, why is it not available? This guy's clearly not running a very like successful publishing operation. So uh, I guess it, his main claim to fame is he has this positive quote from... Uh, um, from Nassim Taleb, where he says, Scalas is domain dependent. He's 99% right on some things. You need to know where. So uh, maybe that's another lesson is uh, you can you can be a total asshole and have like extremely derivative ideas and be a, a scammer and con artist and most people uh, don't like you. But I guess if you cozy up to one influential author and you get that sweet positive blurb, maybe that is uh, quite powerful. In, in attracting not just buyers, but positive reviews, perhaps. I don't know. Uh, it would be great if Paul Scalas would join me to talk. I would love to talk with him. I would have an open mind, uh, but he blocked me, of course. So, and he, and I, I did actually message him asking him to uh, do it, do this talk. And, and he said, no. And uh, so I have to just do the analysis without him. So perhaps I'm missing something, but as far as I can tell, uh, yeah, he's got very derivative ideas, writes really crappy books, uh, has a really poor publishing operation that's like only half functional. And uh, nonetheless, he's been able to do quite well for himself in terms of building a platform, building an audience, uh, having loyal readers who apply his ideas over time. And I mean, what's interesting now is that, um, you know, you could say, you might be saying, Justin, well, okay, uh, why, why, why is there anything here to learn? Like, why would I want to do anything like what Paul Scalise is doing? And I'm not saying that. I'm not saying anyone should develop a model like Paul Scalise's. I'm just saying if he can get a decent platform and by some people be kind of respected uh, as, as a thinker, 
through through these like extremely dubious and shoddy methods, then I'm pretty sure that uh, that that you can. I'm not I'm not saying use his methods. I'm saying do be better. Um, it just the, the point is just to show like how low the bar is really. Um, yeah. So someone in the chat is saying it seems unnecessary to try to take him down. Honestly, it's not even trying to take him down. Like I'm happy for him to continue doing his thing. Um, I, so it's not a takedown really. Uh, I'm, I'm honestly trying to learn from, from everyone and including, uh, scammers like, uh, Paul Scalas. So, right. So, Honestly, I don't think there's too much else to say. I could riff for quite some time because I'm good at that, but um, I don't think this deserves too much time. I think I'll, I'll I'll try to wrap it up in just a minute. I think what I'd, I'd like to um, really just remind you of it are the key principles here, um, which is if I had to kind of summarize them or itemize them, it would be uh, don't be afraid to obsess over one idea. If you feel like you're not being, if you feel like you're not being original enough, you're probably wrong. You don't have to be original. Uh, the second thing is uh, don't be afraid to go hard on the quantity and repeat yourself at, because people aren't experiencing it as repetitive as it feels. All right. And I think another thing that, that really is exemplified by the Paul Scalise case is at the beginning, it really helps to be somewhat shameless. Like I don't think you should be, sh I don't think you, sh you should be so shameless that you should do the sketchy shit that uh, Paul Scalise does. Um, but, What's interesting to me is that like, if Paul Scales decided today that he wanted to actually um, put away his dubious behaviors and actually develop a significant kind of honest intellectual platform, like and and kind of do a do a kind of publishing operation that was more organized and honest and and effective and functional, he absolutely could. Like he could easily pivot because here's the thing: like in the early days, if you if you build some notoriety or you build a following by doing so much sketchy shit, I'm not. I'm still not saying do it. I'm not telling you to do it. I'm just saying um, it benefits you to be shameless in the early days, not care too much about what people think. Because frankly, once you get to like 7,000 followers like Paul Scalas, if he just basically stopped doing all the sketchy shit and uh, cleaned up his act and became like an honest thinker and writer and, and publisher, uh, he could, he you know, he could atone for his sins and have a much more interesting, respectable, uh, I don't mean respectable in an institutional way, I just mean um, he could he could uh, multiply and uh, really develop his his project into something more real and more impressive. He's clearly smart enough, I think, to to develop ideas. He, he could actually start working on good books. He could actually uh, start extending the the Lindy ideas into into something new and real over time. He clearly has the following to do that now, right? So, though I'm not saying you should use any of the tactics that Paul Scalise uses, all I'm saying is he clearly benefits from being a shameless person. Like he doesn't give a fuck that he's pretty much just scamming people. Um, and uh, so don't scam people, but in the early days, you don't have to feel particularly guilty if something you're doing is like not great. That, that's kind of what I'm getting at. Like cultivate a little bit of shamelessness is, is the principle here. I think it really helps you in the early days. And if you do some things that you know, maybe you learn through practice, oh, that wasn't really great. I shouldn't have done that. Or maybe that felt a little shady. I shouldn't have done that or whatever. Um, you learn that just by like feeling those feelings of, uh, that wasn't, that wasn't good. I shouldn't do that anymore. So then you stop doing it. Um, but no one will remember it or no one will care. Um, again, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to say this delicately because I'm not at all saying that you should um, allow yourself to do anything unethical. Not at all. But what I am saying is that a lot of people fear they're going to do anything at all sketchy or like if they offer a product and maybe it's not as good as they hoped, you know, it, let's say, let's say you offer an ebook, right. And people buy it for five bucks or people buy it for 10 bucks, let's say. And then you feel like you write the book, but then you feel like it's not that good. So you actually feel guilty. Maybe that you took $10 from people. You feel like the book is not worth $10. So this is a real problem. You, this is a problem. So if you, especially if you're a good person, this can be a real psychological blockage to actually developing work on the internet and selling it. And uh, so that's that, that's the problem I'm targeting here. Like, look at Paul Scalas. Are you going to be less ethical than Paul Scalas? I think not. Right? If you feel guilty about selling your book for ten bucks, um, is it a better deal probably than one of these books by Paul Scalas? Probably. Okay. So I'm not saying to index your ethics to Paul Scalas. 
I'm just saying if you are paralyzed by a kind of ethical guilt, like you're not giving enough value for your $10 ebook or whatever, I assure you, um, you probably are, or at least in the distribution of what's currently available. If you compare yourself to what people are currently doing, I assure you that the simple fact that you have that kind of ethical uh, conscience probably means that you're going to deliver something at least as good as uh, what is average or what is expected at this point, given that the bar is so low as set by people like Paul Scalis. Okay. So it's really that type of person and that type of blockage that I'm really trying to kind of unlock or, or unblock, if you will, with it, with this case study of, of Paul Scalis. All right. So, so yeah, allow yourself to be a little shameless at the beginning. And if you're really uncomfortable with it, if you actually do think upon reflection, maybe you sold something for 10 bucks and it really wasn't worth 10 bucks. If you still think that after a few months later, first of all, forgive yourself. Uh, Cause you're not as bad as Paul Scalis, but second of all, then you just improve after, right? Like Paul Scalis could easily improve. He could easily start writing real books and he'd have a loyal audience who would actually buy them. Um, and so, yeah. All right. So I think enough on that. And uh, yeah, it, this kind of dovetail, the final point I would emphasize that kind of dovetails with the, the first one, which is that, or I'm sorry, the, the, the most recent one it's uh, you know, you just don't stress about quality too much. Focus on con focus on putting out consistent content at the best level you can, um, as consistently as you can. But uh, don't stress about if it's good enough. Just don't at all. Again, it's going to be at least better than Paul Scalas. Okay, so just remind yourself of that. Uh, if you're feeling if you're struggling with any blockages around, like oh, is it good enough? Oh, is this a sketchy? Is this a sketchy plot of mine uh, to kind of launch a product or whatever? Whatever your kind of moral or ethical compunctions might be, or your, your feelings of, of inadequacy might be. Um, you feel like you're being too repetitive. You feel like you're being uh, too derivative. All of these things that you can kind of tell yourself to prevent you from actually doing your, your work and actually getting your ideas out there and, and developing your, your project and platform. All of, these, all of these blockages, just remember, I'm better than Paul Scalis. <laughs> and I, I honestly think that's, that's, that's useful. Um, so, yeah, I think that's all for me for now. This is a short one. I'm sorry that Paul Scalis was unable to join us. He refused. Uh, if, he, if Paul Scalis ever wants to come back on and discuss any of this, I will have a very open mind. If I'm wrong about any of my diagnosis, I'm happy to update it. Uh, but this is how I see him at the moment. And I hope I've extracted from this particular case study all that I possibly could uh, for those of us like myself who are developing independent intellectual projects outside of institutions on the internet. So uh, yeah, you can listen to this on your phone, on the Other Life podcast, search for Other Life wherever you get your podcasts. If you're listening on YouTube, please do go ahead and subscribe and uh, yeah, be on the lookout for more episodes in this, in this series that I'm doing on internet intellectuals and their digital hustles. Uh, I've done a couple already and I think it seems to be really good. I think, I think we're all learning a lot and uh, people, I'm getting a lot of positive feedback that uh, we really are doing real research really on on what are the currently uh, kind of most interesting and effective models really for, for uh, developing an intellectual platform and doing it in a way that's uh, financially remunerative through various forms of, of creative kind of digital hustling. So uh, Paul Scalis represents one, one kind of extreme. Uh, and though I would not recommend many of his dubious uh, tactics, I, I do think that we've been able to learn a thing or two from him. So uh, you know, that's what it's all about. So, all right, folks, thanks a lot. I think I'm going to wrap it up for now. And uh, I got much more coming up. Uh, you can go to the other slash events, and you'll see a bunch more coming up, uh, this week and next and, and the week after we'll have people like Anna Kachian and Eggy, the incel rapper and celebrity. We'll have uh, a few other people too. So, so check it out and yeah, I'll talk to you folks later.